very much for coming and uh, yeah, now it's with you. Okay. <laughs> I hope you're all stuck to the news. I'm not going to do anything very erudite. I thought we'd have a bit of fun. Um, there have been a couple of talks recently, one on game theory and another on chaos. And I thought it might be nice to stay with that theme, but actually inject a bit of finance in it, because it's supposed to be something to do with finance. So that's what this is about. Uh, Fractured Fairy Tales uh, is a thing that you used to have a thing called children's television with the Wombles and the Magic Roundabout and all uh, the Clangers. Well, Fractured Fairy Tales was a child's program that I used to watch and is now back on the internet. It's not as funny as it used to be when I was about 10. <laughs> so, however, uh, so the title of the talk was something like Fractals, Finance and Fractured Fairy Tales. I couldn't really resist the alliteration. Something nice about the alliteration. So, so, so most, of, most of my slides are just pictures, but there's one or two with talk. So, yeah, so I'm mainly going to be talking about uh, financial systems, but towards the end I'm going to talk a bit, a bit more about economic ones. I, I was at Birkbeck for a couple of years doing some econometrics, so I sort of think I know something about economics. Well, as much as an economist, isn't it? <laughs> um, and I want to actually try and answer a few questions, which is, if you're looking at derivative processing, pricing, which we've done a bit of work in, most people say that all the assumptions are pretty weak, which is where the fractured fairy tales come from. But we still use them uh, as pricing engines. Uh, and so the questions are, can some of the work that's been done in dynamic systems be applied to producing better, to producing better um, estimates? Uh, and what do the various flavours of the three C's, I'll set those over in there, uh, prove? Uh, and are they useful? And if not, and if they don't work in economic systems, then what hope are there for modern day dynamics? Are we okay? Uh, I think so. Can, can, you, can, you, can you hear what we are saying, Said? In the in here, Sorry, can you? Going to give the talk. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm very sorry. I mean, what happened once? We actually had um, audio problems. Can you hear things? Yeah. Do you mind if you? No, I don't mind at all. You don't want me to start again. No, 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 I no for that. Fine. I think we were fine. Uh, I've forgotten everything I was going to say. So, I think anyway. I'm really sorry about this, but I just didn't want to, wanted to make sure that we do report. Right. So, um, yeah. So, if there's no hope for using modern dynamic systems theory uh, uh, in economics, then is there any hope that you can use it at all? So those are the kind of things I want to talk about. Quick summary. I'm going to talk about the main players, which goes back to 1890. Um, uh, the three C's are complexity, chaos, and catastrophe theory. Okay, so chaos is where the fractals come in. Uh, I'm going to sort of talk a bit about where they're applied to and the work that's been done in finance as we go along. And then at the end, if we've got time, uh, I'll say whether or not there is any th anything to offer in finance and economics and some of the current approaches. Apart from the slides, which I'll make available, I have done a, a four-sheet references with some books, some references, and some URLs, which again I'll make available to you. So <coughs> one or two are in this talk, but there's a whole load more. Uh, and of course you can just use Mr. Google, he knows everything, doesn't he? <laughs> okay, so so uh, so to so talking about the three C's, we're actually saying that um, complex systems can lead to chaos and chaos can lead to catastrophe. Okay, and <coughs> I'm actually, before we talk about this, I'm going to talk about a couple of Frenchmen. Okay, so the first Frenchman is this guy. Oh, not that one. 
okay, who's called Poncare. Anybody? You've heard of Poncare, yeah? Okay, yeah. So actually, this book was in my local village library when I was watching Fresh Fairy Tales. So I read it, and it's, it's actually quite good. It's out again now, uh, in paperback, for about a tenner. Uh, and, uh, and it says it goes from Zeno to Poncari. Actually, it goes to Cantor, but Cantor's sort of person you don't talk about, so I think, um, I think people stuck with Poncari. Poncari had a more famous cousin. Does anybody know? Brother. Who? His brother. Cousin it was. I think his brother was the president. He was president. I think he was his cousin, Raymond. I think he was, he was president of the France during the Great War, during the First World War. Nobody ever thinks, knows about him, apart from one guy, <laughs> <laughs> who's got his relationship wrong. <laughs> no, I don't know. We'll look it up afterwards. Anyway, uh, whereas uh, this guy's well known. And he's in the book, he's... Uh, touted as the last great universalist, which means that he worked in a whole range of subjects from pure analytical stuff all the way over to um, <coughs> uh, applied science, etc. So, so he's considered, nowadays they say that maths is too broad a, a church for you to be able to actually work in them all. Uh, so one of the things Poncari did was he, he uh, did some work on phase plane, okay, so, uh, which we'll be used to. So here's a phase plane of famous rabbit and foxes thing where, you, where the rabbits eat <coughs> the rabbits, uh, the foxes eat the rabbits and then die and then the rabbits all do what rabbits do and produce a lot more rabbits. Uh, the foxes seem to be doing better than the rabbits here, which I'm not quite sure about. And by filtering out the, um, the time dependency, then obviously you can plot the number of rabbits against... Uh, and just to show it's... I, did, I got a French one, since Poncar is French. So I got, right. <laughs> and show that it goes around. In fact, Poncar looked at the fact that... You, if you looked at phase planes, sometimes they produce stable points, fixed points. Sometimes they shot off uh, to infinities. And sometimes you started them and they, they went round and round and, and finished up on what's called a limit cycle, either an internal limit cycle or went round and round on an external limit cycle. So essentially he was classifying uh, the kind of work that... Uh, <coughs> and he produced a thing where if you take sections across a 3D then and put those in phase space, this is known as a Poncare section. Okay, um, the, so this is a, a Poncare section of a thing known to all engineers called the Duffing equation, which is a forced equation where you're using a sine wave forcing and it produces quite a complicated behaviour. Uh, but it looks pretty, so I put it in. Um, <coughs> we were looking at this one, actually. This is... Um, and I've put the URL, uh, but we were having a quick look at that when we came in uh, here. Uh, it's a shock wave, so you've either got to have a shock wave player on your local machine or <coughs> have uh, flash uh, in your browser. But then you can move things around and you can show that here's a, a planet, different size suns, they're both the uh, same, that actually the motion of is very chaotic and not repeatable. Now he did this in 1887 in response to a question from the Queen of Sweden who was asking about, you know, Newton, they, they could solve two, the two-model um, gravitational problem, but what about three? And uh, so Poncari's work uh, showed that, in fact, you got a highly irregular patterns. Uh, it wasn't called it chaos at the time, but clearly it's, um, it's not the kind of regularity 
I was watching in Horizon the other day, and in fact, there is a thought that the solar system isn't stable, and that things like Jupiter and Saturn have moved in and out, you know, over the years, and actually one of the reasons that you got the asteroids is because Jupiter has moved in and, and it's actually kept. Uh, so, and obviously, if it's not unstable, then they're still moving around. Okay, so but I think they take longer than than we've got. So, <laughs> so we'll get through tonight, <laughs> if nothing else, before Jupiter sort of gets a bit closer to us. Uh, so yeah, so actually, gravitational fields are unstable. That goes back to 1887, so 1890s. Uh, this is the other Frenchman, uh, Louis Braclier, and. <coughs> He, Pancari was his external, here he is in his PhD robes, Pancari was actually his external, so he got his PhD, yeah, here's proof, um, uh, and Pancari rather like Gauss and Euler was criticised for not showing a great deal of interest in other mathematicians at the time. Uh, the usual argument is a lot of the things they came up with, these guys had done and stuck in a drawer and forgotten all about them. So when somebody else came and said, here's a really good thing, well, I did that a few years ago, you know. <laughs> What's so clever about that? Anyway, uh, as you probably know, he, oh, you know, we, we, he did some work on uh, applying um, random walks, Brownian motion random walks, to the stock exchange. And this was in 1900 in his doctoral work. <coughs> um, he actually wasn't the first person, so this guy here, who nobody's ever heard of, was a Danish astronomer, and he actually did the same sort of work um, on Brownian motion in the 1880s. Okay. Uh, I don't think that Bachelorette referred to Thiel, and then five years later when Einstein came along with his paper that he got the credit for, he didn't refer to Bachelet. It wasn't a thing you did. You didn't actually give credit to anybody else <laughs> who'd done the work beforehand. Still don't, if you can get away with it. <laughs> um, okay, so what he did was to look at a model that has stock prices that are random, there's a risk-free rate and the vol volatility of the return are constant, throughout the options life. You don't pay any taxes, stock doesn't pay any dividends, and the options are European, yeah? I mean, i.e. you've got a fixed time when you can exercise the option. Okay, so that's clear, yeah, I don't have to... Right. Okay, and he produced in his thesis um, this model for calls and puts, which you, if you're this is Bachelier. Yes, this is Bachelier. This, this was not return. It was the... It's not. We, we've got uh, Black Scholes later. Is the That's right. We got this later. Yeah. No, no. So, yeah. So, this is Bachelier's formula for calls and puts with... A, and as you can see, you know, it's a Brownian motion, so the, the dependence is on the root of the time. Uh, but, yeah, it's... Uh, <coughs> It's quite close to uh, some of the things. There wasn't the Nobel Prize in uh, <laughs> economics then, so, so they couldn't give it to him. Actually, there's an institute now for Bachelier, um, but he was not, he didn't get a very good job because although he got the PhD and Poncari said it was quite interesting, um, he didn't say it was wonderful, which of course it was. Uh, so he got himself a kind of minor job, you know, somewhere in France, which was Still probably a nice place to work, but he didn't get Paris and the Sorbonne and things like that, which is a bit sad. Uh, but he's, he's well thought of now. Now, <coughs> um, so I'm going to start talking, we're going to come back to these guys, a bit about one of the first three. So I'm going to do them in the opposite order. Catastrophe, chaos, and then if we've got time, complexity. Now I've done bits of work in all those. Uh, my doctoral work was on um, explosions in gases, okay, and I had 
two successes. One was I actually solved a problem that had been around about 40 years, and the other, which I'm more proud of, is, is I blew the lab up. <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, it was a good way to finish, you see. They, they insisted I did some experimental work, and I was really a mathematician. So, <laughs> so we just, luckily, I was behind a shield, which I didn't used to do. So, so yeah, so I blew the lab up. Uh, and that was how I went. I went out with a bang, actually, as you could say. Okay. So, um, so catastrophe theory. I looked at catastrophe theory. Didn't use it. Used something else. Uh, but it was the work of yet another Frenchman called René Tom uh, in the 1960s. Okay. So uh, between. Bachelier and Tom, not much happened. The, uh, well, there was a couple of world wars and 40 million people died, <laughs> but not much happened uh, in between. Uh, there was some work on Brownian motion from uh, Levier and Weiner and um, Ito, uh, but that was more actually um, sort of pure maths than applied to any particular thing. So one thing that did happen in the Second World War, of course, is that there was a the beginning of electronic computing. And therefore people could start to solve equations numerically, uh, which is the kind of things that Poincaré and whatever couldn't do. So so they couldn't produce some of these wonderful charts. Yeah. Actually, one of the things I tried to do, because I was actually interested in in explosions. One of the things I try to show in my thesis is that you actually, if you're giving a limit, which is computed, it's very much one-sided, i.e. people usually want to know it's not going to blow up. Okay. I mean, unless it's the military, and then they want to know it is going to blow up, but most of them actually want to know it's not going to blow up. So you actually have to say, this is a limit, okay, and, you know, and I can guarantee that at this limit it's stable. Okay, so because we're computing a thing and therefore there is a, a variation. Okay, so, so people started. Now, um, catastrophe theory was very much a qualitative um, theory, and uh, the term and the person who really got it going was this guy, Christopher Zeman. Uh, <coughs> who um, went on, he was recruited to develop the Department of Mathematics at Warwick, which he did with a great deal of success. And he was also known as a, like Faraday, who's a very good lecturer. Now, I was lucky to actually meet Zeman in 1978. I was on sabbatical from Brighton at Imperial. My wife-to-be had spoken, uh, she was an anthropologist, uh, at the Royal Society that summer. And um, <coughs> so we managed to get ourselves uh, seats at the back for the... Now, Zeman's lectures are all online, on YouTube, well, on RI. Uh, and the six of them, they really made them work in those days, the kids. I tell you, it's hard work. And they look quite tricky at the time. So uh, there's one other guy, oh, hello. there's one other guy uh, called Vladimir Arnold, who actually is a sort of a bit of a latter-day Poincaré, he's a Russian, uh, and he contributed to topology and thing. Arnold, rather like Einstein, was had lots of quotes and so you can look him up for his quotes. One of my favourite ones, as a sort of applied mathematician physicist, he said, mathematics is really just a branch of physics where the experiments are very cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. Um, so this, this is Rennie Tom. And Tom looked at the four, five, six, seven surfaces. The top four are all in one variable. So a third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Uh, the bottom three are all in two variables and they're all called umbilical, I suppose. Um, to think about uh, being joined. 
Okay, and then you, if you differentiate those, look at the potentials, uh, you can actually look at the places where you get bifurcations. And a bifurcation represents a switch. Uh, here's a picture. <coughs> represents a switch um, from one state to another, which is what a catastrophe is. Now, actually, all catastrophes aren't bad. The top one, which is the most elementary, is called the fold. And if we didn't have that, then our thermostats wouldn't work very well uh, in central heating because they're forever switching in and out. But actually you get a bit of hysteresis whereby the temperature gets high and then it drops down here, the thermostat switches off and then it goes down and it jumps up again. So because of that hysteresis you actually get this bang bang that actually means that things not forever wobbling in and out. So, so that the fold is the most elementary one. Um, Chris got very interested in the cusp. We'll talk about that in a minute. But then he, these are the other two of the of the four. It's got the name of the swallowtail and the butterfly. Uh, and here's Chris Seaman. Actually, uh, I put this in because this is very 70s. Isn't it? None of those are me, by the way. Uh, that could be me, except I didn't wear glasses and I've never had a beard. So, but uh, you anyway, know, here he is teaching. Um, and demonstrating something by pointing at the board, which is always a good thing to do. Um, actually, as a the Institute of Mathematics, uh, they have a, a medal given every year for promotion of mathematics. So who knows? I might even get one for this talk. <laughs> well, I doubt it very much, really. However, okay. And here's the Christmas lecture. So um, so here's the cusp. And here he is talking, and I've put down here, and it's also in my list, the actual URL. So this is the last one. So the poor, the poor children had to... Now, I've gone through, because uh, we knew... Has anybody seen the Christmas lecture? Do you know about Bill Coates, the, the guy who used to wheel in all the... That was, Hazel was really a friend of his. So I've, I've gone in to see if I could spot him myself. It's probably a good thing I couldn't, but Bill's in there occasionally. So this is the very last one when he tries to explain about catastrophe uh, uh, and uh, they're, they're very good, although they look a bit like early Doctor Who uh, um, episodes nowadays. So, but uh, worth a look and quite long. And it's interesting to see because um, the RI haven't put that many of their um, the lectures on, but Siemens was known, as well as Lathwaite and George Porters, as some of the really big early lectures in Christmas lectures. Right, so Zeeman applied his model, uh, two models, the cusp and the butterfly, to um, lots of different things. Aggression in dogs. He has a thing called the catastrophe machine, which is like two wheels with a couple of um, elastic uh, bands, and he turns it round and it produces strange things go on. Uh, release from self pity, that's interesting. And the behaviour of the stock market, which is what uh, is interesting us. Also, buckling's about same bit phase transitions. And then later he looks at a different um, thing, which is anorexia nervosa and war policy, which are clearly more complicated than the stock market because you need a higher, uh, a higher catastrophe, René Tom, than the, just the cusp. You have to go up to the butterfly. So, so good or what. And there's a, 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 he's got some selected papers. Seaman all his life. Um, pushed catastrophe theory. All the, oh, here's a picture of um, of the cusp as um, uh, applied to markets. So the idea is, you, this is like a 3D. So as you come along here, then the normal behaviour can suddenly produce this region where you can't actually be, a bit like a hysteresis. So when you get here, you drop down. And then you come back up, and then you drop down, and then you come back up, and similar. And here is a bifurcation to show this. So, <coughs> so the papers and also the RI lecture discuss this model of the stock market. It has to be said, 
that it was heavily criticised at the time by Zala and Sussman. In fact, it was criticised before he presented in 1997, <coughs> who said it was too simplistic and actually didn't bring anything to the table. But I did find a paper in 2009 by these two guys who are suggesting that there is some mileage in uh, cusp catastrophe models and that they explain the 1987 crash. Although they also say it doesn't do too, too well with 2003. So uh, again, my list of references um, will uh, has a, a reference to that. <coughs> okay, uh, there's a couple of books. Um, uh, Tim uh, Ian Stewart, another guy I know who's uh, still at Warwick. He, he ter he's a, also a very good communicator, and he's a quite quite a long time. The BBC have grabbed him on the radio. Uh, I don't know if it's literally um, for in our time. He often turns up to talk about. He's also a, a, a xenologist. I met him at. Uh, um, the Oxford Union when he was talking about are oh, the little green men and he said they probably are but they're not green. So, uh, uh, so, so he wrote a book and a paper with a guy called Tim Poston. Neither of them continued to work in catastrophe theory uh, but if you actually uh, and I bought this use it from Amazon used for about a fiver um, it actually does have some proper mathematics in it. A lot of these books have a lot of um, waffle, but not very much hard maths. But the uh, Poston Stewart book is the other way around, and it explains. <coughs> There's another guy called Bartley Rosser, who's more an economist um, than a mathematician, but he does talk about uh, catastrophe and chaos theory. And uh, again, that's available. Uh, in fact, you know, I mean, most of these things, if you're expert in the dark web <coughs> and the Tor browser, you can find. So, and if you can't, then email me and I'll send you copies because I've found them all. <laughs> right, the ones I haven't bought, I've found. So, uh, however, I'm not going to tell you how, just in case somebody listening. <coughs> um, okay, so, yeah, so, so. Catastrophe theory didn't really bring a lot to the table, <coughs> although it does seem to have had a, a renaissance in the last six or seven years, uh, and there are papers on it now. Um, so, chaos. Um, so, a few names in here again. Poincaré we've met already. Um, so, the three-body problem, 1887. Uh, <coughs> Gaston Julia and Pierre Fatou were actually pioneers in the 1920s. I think one of the problems the French had is that they insisted on writing their papers in French. Who the hell reads French papers in French? Right. So all the papers got ig ignored, essentially. Just they'd have written them in English. Somebody might have understood them and gone on. So, yeah, so again, Gaston Julia and Fatou were largely ignored, but they did a lot more work on Poncare and on looking at, and on Julia. We, we saw, anybody who was watching, you saw the Julia sets rotating round. <coughs> um, and uh, Fatou took it a bit further. Uh, three guys that you, we're going to talk about a little bit in a minute. Uh, Feigenbaum, Lorenz and Mandelbrot, of course. A bit more about Mandelbrot. If you've read Gluck's Chaos, little pot boiler on Chaos, he spends a bit of time on that. So, <coughs> so, um, so the first one, oh, yeah, so the first thing to say is uh, Chaos is not the same as randomness. Okay. Um, so, a thing that's random, if you do it again, you get a different result. Okay, so, so it's non predictable. If you think it's chaotic, and you do it again, and you use exactly the same numbers in exactly the same machine, you get exactly the same result. Okay. Your problem is, if you change the number just a little bit, you get a different result. 
thing. And I'll say what a little bit means in a minute because I want to actually try and define rigidly what we mean by chaos from a mathematics or point of view. So same parameters, same initial conditions, same result. Small changes lead to very different results, which means it's impossible to actually um, make any kind of prediction uh, because you can't repeat an experiment and have exactly the same conditions. <coughs> so uh, I, I've, I've put together, this is me, so um, I, I try to make it as unintelligible as possible really. Um, it's a dynamic system that can degenerate into an infinite set of disjointed solutions under changes in parameters or initial conditions. So what do I mean by that? Well I mean in a way just what I've said. If you take a system, a dynamic system, i.e. something that is expressed in terms of differential equations, and you change a thing by let's say 1%, you get a totally different solution. If you change it by 0.1%, you still get a different solution. Change it by 0.01%, you still get a different solution. And however smaller and smaller you get, you still get a different solution. It diverges. Okay. So there's an infinite number. Any number at all will produce long term a different solution. So it's degenerated into an inf Other than that, what you've really got is just multiple catastrophes. It's only when you actually degenerate into an infinite number of solutions you've actually got proper chaos from a mathematical, from my version of a mathematical point of view. Um, and we'll see a couple of examples of these in a minute. Um, some, some examples, compound pendulum. Um, so the idea is we, we know that the single pendulum sinusoidal, but if you have a second bob then it jumps over. I've got quite a nice thing here, I won't switch over, uh, but it's on, the, it's on my references as well. Um, where the triple pendulum, the quad, quadratic pendulum, the quintuple all produce really weird curves. Okay, um, a dripping tap is chaotic. This is one where you've tried to switch it off but it still drips, and you know, you've laid in bed and it drips, and then you keep waiting for the next drip. And just as you go, it goes, and it's dripped again. <laughs> Drives you mad, doesn't it? And if you actually look at the frequency of that, it's chaotic. So a dripping tap is a chaotic system. Oh, come uh, we've talked about the three-body problem. Uh, the, the snooker ball's on an oval table. If you actually bash a white ball around, you get actually a chaotic. Actually, if you actually watch me play snooker, snooker balls on a rectangular table is chaotic. But <laughs> on an oval table, it's chaotic for anybody, really. So it, the actual track that is made by a snooker ball on an oval table is a chaotic track. Uh, rapid, eye, rep, rapid eye movement sleep. Is chaotic and one that's we were chatting a bit about Cassini the, the, earlier on. Um, one that came up from Cassini's Hyperion, which is one of Saturn's moons. They've been mapping that and they've showed that it is tumbling chaotically. I mean, it's one of those things where if you wait around long enough, it may be periodic, but it don't look like it. Um, so yeah, and that's obviously due to the influence of rings and other whatever. So so there's quite now. <coughs> I'm actually going slightly out of out of time here because because Michel Feigenbaum did this work in the 70s, um, and all he, he showed that a very simple. So there'd been work on chaos before that, which we'll look at in a minute. He showed that a very simple recurrence relation, just x into one minus x, uh, using R, where R is quite large numbers. Um, that here splits into two separate sets of solutions uh, and then later on it splits into four and then into eight and then into 16, 32, whatever. Um, and when you get to this which is slightly under four you get an infinite number of solutions. So up to that point this isn't a chaotic diagram, these are just multiple catastrophes. 
a lot of them, but they still are. It gets chaotic at that boundary when you actually have an infinite number of catastrophes, i.e. So, so Feigenbaum <coughs> did the work. He, in the 70s, computers were quite cheap, and I think you could do it on your calculator if you could afford one of these <coughs> posh calculators. Um, but <coughs> he did a bit more than that. And what he actually showed was that if you take the ratio of the first splitting here, um, and then you take that ratio, and then you do that again between here and here, that that limit is that it does reach a limit which is known as the Feigenbaum delta constant. There is another one. Um, and the conjecture is that that's a transcendental number, irrational, like pi or e or whatever. Oh, well, nobody's proved it, but it, it is a number, and it seems to be a fundamental number in chaos theory. Um, now, actually, I, I was saying I was in at Imperial in the 1978. I was actually working with Brian Spaulding, and we were working on turbulent flow. And we were working on stretching and folding and whatever. Um, so that's my sort of bit on chaos. I was actually <coughs> working on, again, it was still combustion, it was fluid flow. Um, and we were trying to predict what happened when a, a thing became turbulent. Actually, Brian wanted to write a program and make money out of it, which I think he probably did in the end. So. <laughs> well, actually, I, do, I know he did. Actually. <laughs> okay, so. Um, so, <coughs> I'm going to go back here to a guy called Edward Lorentz, um, and here he is, nice guy. He was working on a mini computer. Uh, you probably can't read, but it actually says low in cost there. Uh, their version of low in cost is about $25,000, alright, uh, uh, easy to program, well, not sure about that. And <laughs> most in demand. <laughs> it's okay. So here's a picture of Lorentz's LPG30. And there's a picture of Lorentz. He was actually a meteorologist. You probably can't read that, but you can see it later. It's actually a book on meteorology. And what he was doing was he was modeling um, three sets of equations to model the weather. Okay. Now, normally. <coughs> When you, this is from my book, when you modelled uh, three sets of equations, this is the Volterra equation for predator prey, but one in the middle that this guy eats that and this guy eats that. So it's a kind of predator intermediate prey species. And you get the same sort of thing. You get limit cycles, it goes round and round. And most people thought that that's the kind of behaviour you were going to get. Okay. Lorentz... Um, he had to go home, uh, so he stopped the computer, and then he, was, he wanted to carry on the next day, but he decided he wouldn't carry on from where he'd stopped it. He'd, he'd sort of look at, a, at the reader. Remember, these are just masses of numbers that they then plotted on graphs. So, so he started with the values like an hour before, and what he found was that he got different solutions from that, for that hour, then he was getting, so he did what most people do, he suspected the kit. You know, so he said, this must be something wrong with the computer. <laughs> it's not doing the same results as yesterday. So they checked all the computer and everything. But he was clever enough to say, well, suppose I go back two hours before, and we start from there. And he got different solutions again. And the reason was, he was printing out three significant figures. These were like, 32-bit machines, storing numbers to seven significant figures. So it actually wasn't putting in exactly the same numbers as the computer had stored internally. He was just typing them into whatever he printed off on his printout. Okay. Here's his equations. And actually you can see that these don't have any sine wave forcing term at all. Not like the Duffing equation. They've just got cross product terms. You know, three equations with cross product terms. And they go up and down and down here and up and down and down here. Um, and if you're looking at 
Poncare sections, well actually it's a 3D section, this goes round and round and round and then shoots off here and goes round and round there and eventually it keeps going forward and backwards and they call these chaotic attractors. Okay, um, so what we're actually trying to find out from chaos theory in a way is whether or not a dynamic system is very sensitive to changes in a parameter. So it could be, this has got a few parameters like omega and r and b, so it could be that small changes in r create a lot of chaos where you've really got to work quite hard to, to modify omega. So that's one of the kind of things you really want to try and find out. It's, it's a bit statistical um, and sometimes you, things go wrong like there's the, there's the famous hurricane in 1987 when Michael Fish said, well it's just going to be a bit windy tonight. <laughs> you remember that one? <laughs> and all the trees fell down. Yeah, so yeah, so but by and large you'd like to say some parameters uh, or initial, are really affecting chaos, others, uh, yeah, if you change them you get different solutions but it takes a long time so that's what I'm kind of thinking of. Um, uh, and as you can see if you actually plot X you get some funny... <coughs> um, another Frenchman, uh, Michael Ennel, uh, he actually did a similar thing but going back to Fogenbaum type things uh, this is actually second order because you, if you substitute Y for X minus N here you get a second order equation and showed that you get a similar kind of map and whatever uh, 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 actually they live a long time these French guys, they, he was still around in uh, 2013 and uh, they had quite a nice party for him in Paris. Uh, this is a guy that most people have heard of and we're going to talk a bit more about him, Mendelbrot. Okay, uh, so the Mendelbrot set is actually the black bit. So all that coloured bit's got nothing at all to do with the Mendelbrot set, it's the black bit. Okay, um, and what it is is if you start with this is these are, if you start with a number in the it's that way actually they've just turned it a bit if you, if you start with a complex number so an x and a y and you square that you get another complex number another x and another y and the question is if if that will that just keep jumping around and stay finite or will it sort of go off and eventually become infinite and the boundary between where it stays finite and where it uh, then begins to go is the, um, is the Mendelbrot set. The colours, what they do is they actually say let's stop when we've done 100 because 100 is enough. Right? And, um, and yeah, if things have only taken 30 to get over this threshold we'll colour them blue and if they've taken 50 we'll colour them orange and if we've taken... Right. So you get some nice colours and these actually colours are just representative of how fast or slow um, things are beginning to shoot away to infinity. But the actual Mandelbrot set... Oh, I'll go back. Oh. The actual Mandelbrot set is the black bit. Um, and I think as we were chatting before when I showed you the, the Julia set it is actually a, it's not a bit of a pun, a superset <laughs> of the Mandelbrot set. The Mandelbrot set is a set, it, I remember Julia did his work in the 30s, 20, okay, 20s, 30s, but he didn't have computers to print pretty pictures, uh, so, uh, yeah, so he couldn't really yeah. Uh, but it, the Mandelbrot set is a special case of, of that. Uh, you can actually produce some chaos just by looking at the real line, not, not even. So this was a um, program I wrote in Julia. So you start with a constant and you square the constant, uh, uh, add the constant to it, get the new one and then you carry on squaring it. Most of the time it shoots off, but between minus two and a quarter, some really interesting things happen, you know. So this bit's relatively weird, but this bit is really weird stuff. Uh, now these are all 
run to n equals 30. And if you actually went to 31, then you get a different thing. That peak might be smaller, uh, and this one might be larger. But by and large, you'd still get a, a random thing. And what you're getting there is, is this period doubling. OK. So, so you're actually getting... Uh, and, that, and even in the middle here, do you remember the Feigen bomb? They had a, a band down the middle that was relatively stable, and then we had a lot of stuff. Do you remember him? Go back. Uh, there we are. So you remember there was this bit here that looked like suddenly we're in the high of the hurricane and not much is happening? Well, you get the same sort of thing here. So if we actually expand between 1.62 and 1.64, uh, now here we've got like period doubling, here we've got period quadrupling and octupling and whatever sexagesimal dexing, um, yeah, <laughs> onwards, yeah, in exactly the same way as you're getting with, yeah. and in fact, there is a relation between this kind of fractal and this. If you draw lines down here and you put the thing you get exactly the same, and therefore you get the Feigenbaum number cropping up in the Mandelbrot set. So something's going on. Right? I'm not sure if people know yet what's going on, but something's going on, because everything's tied to everything else. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not read enough recent papers, but... Uh, and that's why this Feigenbaum constant is considered to be a fundamental constant uh, and why we talked about Feigenbaum. Now, I, I just put this in because, as I said in my PhD, I didn't use any of this stuff. I used some Russian work by Lipunov. We looked at the stability of perturbations around the boundary to try and see if the perturbation was stable. Um, and so I put that in just to satisfy myself that... Uh, yeah. Right, uh, some finance now. There is one of the Black Shoals Mertens. It's the Shoals one, looking very, very neat. <coughs> um, and of course, they did the work based on um, work by Ito. So remember, we said Leve, Vina, and Ito did some work between the walls. Uh, and then they applied. Uh, this is a stochastic process, so they had an extra term to the Bachelet and came up with a very similar, you know, I mean, there isn't a lot of difference. This is just for the call, um, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's quite a similar thing to Bachelet's a whole load, what, six, 75 years earlier. Okay, but they got, they got a Nobel Prize for that, so... <coughs> I so said, it can't be bad. Okay, uh, so they, they, they made some assumptions. Uh, so frictionless markets we had before with Bachelet, uh, no additional payments, i.e. no um, dividends. Um, uh, the, the market is unlimited, i.e. you can always trade. Um, no arbitrage. Uh, um, I'm not sure what that bottom one really means, but uh, I think it means they'll spend all the money if they think they're going to make a dick come to it, make, make a killing on it. Okay, I put those first five are actually also the five assumptions that come in the Cap M uh, model. Uh, so the um, the other three are solely black shows. There's continuous trading in markets. This, which was a fundamental one of the Bachelier work, was that we're talking about uh, a geometric Brownian motion, um, where the asset has a normal distribution, uh, and also that the volatility is constant. Time independent, but it means the same thing. <coughs> okay, um, so none of those are true. <laughs> right. Not one of them is true. Okay. Some are less true than others, but um, no. Same. However, most pricing engines use the Black Shields model today. Okay, and still do it. 
Uh, it used to be said, why, why is black shoals used? And they said, well, it's quick and it gives you an answer. Well, that's like saying use three and a seventh for pi and three if you're in a hurry. I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it, doesn't, it isn't a sensible reason for using a thing that you could get an answer. But of course, it is well used. <laughs> so that's where one of our fairy tales comes in. And a lot of people have criticised that, not just, not just me. And in fact, uh, Mend Mandelbrot, which we'll talk about in a minute, has, um, has done that. How am I doing on? I'm going to on time. Oh, I'll be all right. Okay, Got fine. <coughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I say none of these are true. So, there's been certain changes, um, including what's called Levy or affine diffusion jumps, uh, and obviously looking at volatility where the um, where that is a stochastic change rather than being constant. Because the problem with that is then you get non-tractable solutions. All right? I mean, suddenly you haven't got a formula anymore because you've stuck in, in jumps by putting an extra, this is a Poisson term, in the, um, in the normal Ito formula. Um, uh, so, so suddenly you've got something that you don't, you haven't, you can't just say, here's the answer. You know, you've got to solve it with a computer anyway. Uh, just to say what an affine jump is, in a way, uh, what it means is, here's a jump. This is um, change in Deutschmark against the US dollar. This is when there were Deutschmarks. So pre the euro, I guess, 1992. Just about pre the euro, yeah. OK. Uh, so yeah, so, I, so what it really means is, if you actually f forget the jump, then that curve would carry on. Um, so you could shrink it all down and you've really got the same curve. Which really means the volatility isn't changing. Okay, so you've got no change between jumps. Right, and that's that's what so you get affine trans transformation, transformation in terms of um, distance, but not in terms of shape. Okay, so uh, so Leve right. uh, Mandelbrot's written a couple of books. Um, that one actually in paperback. Okay, so you can buy that. Um, it's a bit of a pot boiler, but towards the end there's some stuff. Um, he also wrote one which I have a hard copy of, uh, Fractals, Scaling and Finance. It's an earlier book. Um, uh, but you know, for a tenor it's quite quite a reasonable. Uh, the, the, this one's the second, as is that, second edition. So. <coughs> Uh, Mandelbrot died in about 2009, so it's, it was about four or five years before when they came out with the second edition. Um, so, so he actually is quite critical of, um, and there's a summary here in the review, so again, I, again it's in my thing, but it's also in the slides, so you can look it up. Um, and he, so it's a kind of review of the book, and he asks a few questions. I'm not sure you get the answer, but these are the sort of questions you'd like to know about uh, Mandelbrot's method. Is um, what is there an alternative to Gaussian models? Are jump processes any good? Do they work? They're, they're great at telling, predicting what happened in the past, but are they any good? in predicting what's going to happen in the future. Um, should you use fractals? If so, how do you parameterize a fractal? How do you fit those? Um, uh, can we put confident bounds? We were talking about the fact that in, in the chaotic world we're not, we're actually looking at bounds bounding things statistically and say, you know, most of the time this changes a bit, but not a lot. And then why, have, why are people not using fractals? Why are academics and quants not using fractals? Uh, academics in particular like writing papers, so they've probably got more to lose or gain. <coughs> um, and can you actually use these for risk? So he asks this question. He comes to 
a more positive outlook than I do from reading the book about whether those questions are answered. But you can buy the book or you can email me and I'll send you a copy of a PDF of it. Uh, 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 um, yeah, so these are the kind of questions that... Now, the other thing that Mandelbrot did was, within the book, is he looked at... Um, so what the remember that the underlying geometric Brownian motion has a um, root T um, vena process dependence. So he looked at a thing called um, <coughs> the um, what was it the Hurst parameter, a uh, fractal dimension. Uh, this one actually is Brownian, these are simulated, these are Brownian motion, and if you actually look at returns rather than the actual measure, so this is the daily return, uh, this one has a Hurst parameter, I'll say what that is in a minute, of um, uh, I think 0.3 and that's 0.7, okay, um, and he fitted uh, the various distributions, he got quite keen on a thing called the Cauchy distribution rather than the Cauchy's and the simplest one is like 1 over 1 plus x squared. Okay, so, but there's a whole range of these, but you know, if you think about 1 over x squared, it goes off at the end. It's got fatter tails than the Gaussian. Um, um, but, and he actually fitted the thing called the Peritian distribution, and he actually says if you look at data, so here is empirical data, then it fits, it can be better fitted by a Prussian than it can by a, and here's a fatter tail, so here's your 5% tail, here's your 1% tail, and here's the um, the Gaussian, which is down here, whereas the actual data is higher. So if you're going to do some simulation, why use a Gaussian um, function? Right. Uh, just a quick thing about the Hurst, um, this is a measurement um, you can actually compute this number for various interesting... You know the, the Cox snowflake? No? Okay, well, I haven't got a picture of it. Oh, the Sapinski triangle, uh, Mandelbrot set, it's two. Anything that's a two-dimensional is between one and two. But you can actually go into three, four, five-dimensional shapes, uh, and then you're between two and three, and three and four. Uh, and actually one of the nice ones is extending the Mandelbrot set to three dimensions and there's a picture of it, it's, it's lighter on my, uh, on my slide. So this is the Mandelbrot set in three dimensions which is called the Mandelbulb and uh, one of the conjectures is that uh, its uh, fractal dimension is three which would be the limit uh, for those. Okay, um, so the Preto Distribution looks like this, so it has a, a similar form. It's the real part of this integral with some complex numbers stuck in here. Um, and it's asymptotic to this. So you've actually got four, four parameters rather than two. Um, uh, so it's asymptotic with gamma functions and the odd sign in there. Uh, and it's a kind of family of curves, um, in particular when alpha is 2, you actually get a Gaussian distribution. Uh, if alpha is 1 and beta is 2, you get a Cauchy, and for things in between, you get things in between. So, so Mandelbrot was saying you should use, you shouldn't use a Gaussian because it doesn't fit the data. Okay. Um, Okay, so here's his conclusions. The returns are not Gaussian, uh, uh, especially for short intervals of time. There's a, quite a large ketosis. They're sort of broader, well, they're peakier and, broad and flatter uh, than... Um, volatility is intermittent and it is correlated, and prices change with time. Uh, so he proposed this hypothesis in the book, uh, which is to use Perithian um, and 
um, and to fit the data and to use that to do the calculations to do the costing. Needs to say nobody does, but that's what he proposed. Okay. Um, one other guy before we get into the realm of complexity is, uh, we're not going to say much about complexity. Uh, um, there's a guy called Edgar Peters. Uh, I mean, not many people picked up the Mandelbrot and ran with it, but this is a guy who has. Uh, I haven't read these books, uh, but he has published in Wiley. So I don't know if that gives some sort of credibility to, uh, to what he's in. Um, this one's quite interesting. Uh, Peters himself uh, is probably more an economist than he is a um, financial engineer quant. But I can't really say that until I read the books. So, but uh, I downloaded one of these the other day. But okay, okay. So, so there's so there is somebody else who's writing out there, and these are around about the two thousand mark. Okay, and this is Peters's um, fractal market hypothesis. Uh, we've probably had enough about all that, but it, it's in the slides. So if you download the slides, you can read it yourself. Okay, so. Last one is complexity theory. Okay, um, so so I said I'd done some work within catastrophe in case. I actually did some work in complexity theory as well. Came back from Germany, we worked at the Hammersmith, and I was interested then in how collaborating systems come to conclusions, right, when you've got independent processes. Uh, this was in the 19... James, 95, 96, something like that? Yeah. Um, so, it's, it's, the world has spun around a lot since then. Uh, originally it was called Swarm Dynamics as well. Uh, so, you know, I mean, you see starlings all moving around, but they all seem to know where they're going. Um, and ants move about, but everybody... So, individual agents. Um, and... Um, now it's classified as in various things. So complex physical systems, uh, possibly they're not really compli complicated. They're not really complex systems at all. Uh, in the t in what I'm going to say about complex in a minute. Uh, normally we start looking at graph theory and interconnections. Um, the interest in these has actually increased because again we've got another sudden spurt of computing power. So, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, we all had computers on our desk, but now we've got the cloud and we've got network systems and we can use uh, GPUs and we can get Amazon to spin up 32 cores for us. You know, so suddenly, actually, we can compute things on a whole different level. Um, and because of that, people can start to think about uh, computing more complex systems uh, uh, in the thing. So compli complex physical systems are probably not complex in the s sense I'm going to say in a minute. Complex adaptive systems certainly are. And this was the kind of thing we were looking at uh, at the Hammersmith. These are... Uh, there are individuals, I've got a slide in a minute, who all are capable of making decisions at a very low level, but those low levels contribute to a kind of gestalt uh, total decision. Um, and as I say, these lead to swarm dynamics and morphogenesis, and in fact, Going right the way back to Renny Tum, he was actually interested in morphogenesis. You know, he wasn't interested in things blowing up or the stock market cross crashing. His initial work was in morphogenesis. There's a couple more things. Um, there's a thing now called cyber physical systems, which are interconnected networks with attitude. Okay, um, say a little bit about that. Uh, but actually, internet. Um, denial of service, um, attacks, uh, all these actually are features of 
complex cyber systems where there's a, a great deal of intelligence going into a relatively tight connected system. A lot of work going on that, a lot of it uh, we aren't being told about but it's a big topic. The last one in comp complexity is actually called mathematical complexity and that is something totally different. Uh, mathematical complexity is whether you can solve things quickly in a way. So the famous any P equals MP, anybody? How, what's the easiest way to make, the hardest way to make a million pounds? Anybody know the hardest way to make a, Solve one of the Millennium Prizes. <laughs> the Clay Institute in the Millennium issued seven prizes. Only one of them has been solved by a guy called Gregor Perlman. And he didn't accept the prize money. So uh, he refused the prize. So if you really want to make a million pounds, Try, anyway, one of the problems is known as the, and that really means if you can prove a thing, uh, if you can not prove a thing, can you prove it in the same computational time, i.e., most people think it's not true, i.e., no, so is a thing a non-provable statement, similarly, it can be proved in the same computational time as a prove, to be proved. Um, anyway, it's one of the Clay Institute uh, Millennium Prizes, so six are still to be solved. And what happened to Perlman's money? I don't know, perhaps they've distributed it between the, the other six prizes, who knows? Okay, um, so, co so complexity is not the same as complicated. Complicated systems are deterministic, they're reputable, they may be hard to analyse, but they are analyzable. Compl complex systems, hello, AER, sorry, I'll change that. Um, complex systems are composed of interacting, com this is my version of complex, interacting agents and processings that can adapt. So, and that when they aggregate, they provide a, a behavior which is much more um, than just the whole. Okay, so so these are the second complicated, complex adaptive systems, and they certainly are complex. So the idea is um, a complex system actually consists of a set of sub-complex systems, and there's a set of even one, and down here there's a whole load of parameters. We were sort of working about here, I think, at the Hammersmith. We had sort of subsystems becoming systems, but in the end you got the whole system. Uh, and they look on the fact that a complex system can become chaotic, um, but it may not. Yeah. So, in terms of finance, the stock market is a complicated, a complex system. Lots of people, actually traders, are with herd instincts and bits of information and whatever. So that is certainly a complex system. And in fact, economic systems, the economists and the sociologists are much more interested in complex systems um, than this. So um, one of the solutions is actually that it's difficult to model, but machine learning is one of the um, Deep neural networks is one of the reasons why you can say, if I can't understand it, then let's just hope that the computer can understand it. If we give it enough information, let's see if it'll work it out. And, you know, by and large, it doesn't do a bad job. Okay. Um, so the, there's only a few more slides now. Um, the idea of complicated adaptive systems is that we have a set of agents here with information going in and out, and emerging from this, uh, is some sort of behaviour which is much more than the whole itself. So this idea of emergence uh, is, is quite um, prevalent in complicated systems. All right. Right. All right. Um, so I've got a thing on emergence and what it is and there's a bit about um, uh, the Dow Jones average here. Um, so a lot of people say emergence is, and that is clearly the case if you talk about morphogenesis. You and I have all emerged from, uh, I don't know, amoebas, slime worms, things like that. Uh, uh, 
Um, we've taken a long time to emerge. Some people might say we haven't emerged that well, but we have emerged. Um, so, and of course the big question is how can very complicated systems emerge from very simple processes? So that's what complexity theory is trying to elucidate. Um, here's a very simple, I was in complex, Conway's Game of Life, you've all seen that, where you have four rules about cells, and actually this one is known as the, so this one is actually spitting things down here and keeps on, so from a start, uh,